The trade deadline has passed, but there are still opportunities to improve your team through the waiver wire. I'll give you a few guys who you should be looking to add prior to Thursday's games. And a week after rushing for nearly 200 yards and four touchdowns, Jonas Gray was back on the bench as LeGarrette Blunt took over as the feature back in New England. Was this just a one-week thing, or should we be reanalyzing the Patriots' running game? Also, Josh Gordon is back with a vengeance. What can we take from his big game in Week 12? I'll answer your questions from YouTube and Twitter, and I'll give you a preview of the three Thanksgiving Day games. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Everybody and welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwid, and I am here twice a week, every week, to answer your questions and give you the advice that you need to win your fantasy football leagues. Today, guys, we're going to start off by taking a look at the waiver wire. There's not a lot of guys out there at this point in the season that are really going to completely change your roster or anything like that. But, you know, for those of us who are playing in the deeper leagues, your 14 team, possibly your 16 team or deeper leagues than that even, there are definitely guys that we should be looking to acquire this week if they are still available on your waiver wire. We're going to start off first with Latavius Murray. He is my number one guy on the waiver wire this week. This is a guy who is absolutely tearing it up for the Oakland Raiders over the past couple of games. This past week, four carries, 112 yards, two touchdowns before he went out with a concussion. Now, this guy has eight carries for 155 yards over his past two games. Huge numbers, absolutely an explosive player, definitely the best running back on the roster there in Oakland. DeMarc, or excuse me, uh, Darren McFadden and uh, Maurice Jones-Drew definitely need to move aside for this guy. He is certainly a player who has the potential to put up solid numbers for the remainder of the season. Although, honestly, when you look at Oakland as an offense, there isn't a whole lot to be excited about. They're probably going to be up behind in quite a few games. So that kind of limits his potential upside, to be completely honest with you guys. So I wouldn't be out there starting him this week unless you're in a situation where you're starting him as a flex, possibly. Or, you know, in your, if you're in a league where you start three running backs, maybe there's a possibility that you can get Latavius Murray into your lineup this week. But for the most part, he is a stash player, I think, for your dynasty league, certainly. He should absolutely be owned in every single dynasty league at this point if he's not already. Um, I definitely think he's going to be worth it to have next season. There's a real good chance that he is the starting running back in Oakland next year. And I know Oakland, the running back situation, yeah, it's probably not going to be good. But look, if he can get 15 carries a game, he's going to be a solid fantasy contributor next season. This season, like I said... It could be hit or miss from time to time. We don't know for certain that he's going to get all the carries. We do know that he has been practicing this week, so he should be good to go this week. But at the same time, though, it, it really, really wouldn't be all that surprising if Oakland went out there and decided to give him five, six carries again this week. So don't trust it yet until we see a little bit more. But definitely go out there and pick him up if you're in a deeper league. Next guy, Dan Boom Heron of the Indianapolis Colts. He kind of actually came out of nowhere to get the starting job. Job over Trent Richardson in week 12. He ran for 65 yards on 12 carries. Nothing real special, but the fact of the matter is that the Colts just don't seem to have any confidence in Trent Richardson, and you, can you really blame him? He's been terrible since he went there. He would really just hasn't been anything near what they were hoping to get when they gave up a first-round NFL draft pick for him. And Boom Heron, I, I know the talent isn't spectacular here. I'm not trying to tell you guys that he's going to be like some rock star player, but if he continues to start for the Colts, 
he could put up solid numbers. I mean, Ahmad Bradshaw was putting up really nice fantasy running back numbers, solid RB2 numbers on a weekly basis, and I see that being kind of the upside of what you might get out of a Dan Heron. I'm not really expecting him to be, you know, an RB1 going forward, but I certainly think that he could put up solid numbers for the remainder of the season. I like him about as much as I like Latavius Murray, but I don't think the talent is quite as high here. So that kind of limits his upside. I mean, to be completely honest with you, I have these guys ranked. 1A and 1B at running back. So, you know, pick your pick your choice between the two of them. Um, the thing is, is that Indianapolis's offense is better. So while Dan Heron may not be quite as talented of a player as Latavius Murray, the truth is that he might outscore him just given the fact that he's in a much better offense. So definitely something to think about there. In a dynasty league, I'm not as high on Dan Heron as I am Latavius Murray, if that helps you guys out at all. So do keep that in mind as well. Number three on my list this week, I have Jarvis Landry, wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins. Three touchdowns over his past two games. He also leads the team with 32 targets over his past four games. So he's getting targeted more often than Mike Wallace right now. So that's something to consider. Now, he has also been pretty consistent. He's caught at least three passes in every single game since week one, although he hasn't cracked even 80 yards in any game this year. So he's kind of a player that I think is... Oh, it, it's it, the thing is, is I don't think the high end potential is really there for Jarvis Landry at this point. I'm not expecting him to put up wide receiver one numbers really in any game for the remainder of the year. But if you're looking for a guy to be a wide receiver three on your team, I think Jarvis Landry could contribute. It's also worth noting that he has handled some return duties for the Dolphins. So, you know, he could potentially contribute a touchdown here or there down the stretch. Um, you know, it's it's always hard to predict that, but it's also, you know, a nice little bonus if it does happen for you. So Jarvis Landry is my top wide receiver this week. Number four on the waiver wire, and this one is probably going to surprise people because I think that a lot of people are thinking that this guy is going to have better value than I think he's going to have going down the stretch, and that is LeGarrette Blunt. Now, I mentioned this a little bit in the intro, but LeGarrette Blunt actually shocked everybody this past week by being really the only guy that got significant carries for the Indian or for the uh, New England Patriots this past week. Now, uh, Shane Vereen still did touch the ball a little bit. He caught some passes. He ran the ball a couple of times, but it was LeGarrette Blunt who got 12 carries, 78 yards, two touchdowns here in week 12, signed off of waivers about three days before the games happened this past week. So he did not have a lot of time to practice with the Patriots, but he was out there for practice, unlike Jonas Gray. And I think I, I, it's it's such a frustrating thing because I know a lot of people were relying on Jonas Gray this past week. I did say in my past or in my previous fantasy football swagger podcast that I was benching Jonas Gray everywhere that I had him. And the reason for it was not because I thought that he would get zero carries like he did, but because they had a tough matchup, um, because, it, you know, the, the Detroit Lions have just been so good against the run. But it turns out that I was right in benching him, but for the wrong reasons. I didn't expect that he would get no carries. I expected these guys would probably kind of split carries. Jonas Gray did miss a practice early in the week, and not because of an injury, but because he was late to practice. And then the Patriots have basically an ongoing team rule that if you're late to practice, that you do not practice that day. And that's not a good thing. Obviously, Coach Belichick does not take that kind of stuff well, and he decided to completely sit Jonas Gray. He was active as far as I know, but he did not take a single carry. I don't even think he was on the field for a single snap in the game. So that is very, very tough to predict. But what I will say is that I kind of think this is more of a disciplinary thing than it is a, a looking forward and predicting what's going to happen down the road kind of a thing. So to me, I'm expecting Jonas Gray, Shane Vereen, and LeGarrette Blunt to each get, you know, roughly 30% of the snaps for this team going forward. What does that mean? Well, it means that you could potentially have a big game out of Jonas Gray. You could potentially have another big game out of LeGarrette Blunt, but it's going to be very, very difficult to predict when those games happen. If guys are only getting eight carries a game, it kind of has to happen at the goal line. They kind of need to be the guy who gets into the end zone to give you any sort of substantial fantasy value. So to me, I'm not in love with Garrett Blunt after one week. I don't think that the Patriots 
consider him a franchise running back or they wouldn't have allowed him to walk this past year or uh, a couple of seasons ago, excuse me. So I'm just really not super excited about LeGarrette Blunt. Um I think that he is probably the most likely guy to get the goal line carries going forward. But you, with the New England Patriots, we've talked about this many, many times. I don't really trust anybody in this offense outside of Rob, Rob Gronkowski and Tom Brady. That's about it. Julian Edelman is solid for PPR. He'll have his good games here and there as well where he kind of breaks out. Uh, Brandon LaFell has actually been pretty productive uh, as of late as well. But as far as like relying on them to be an every week starter for me in fantasy, I just don't love the New England Patriots. I've never really liked what they do with their running back situation because it fluctuates so, so much from week to week. And it's so very, very difficult to predict what is going to happen. The only guy that I can ever remember being a consistent RB1 type of player in New England in the entire time that Tom Brady's been there, as far as I recall, has only been Corey Dillon. Everybody else has pretty much been fluctuating up and down and, you know, being moved in and out of the lineup depending on what they're doing, whether they're passing or they're running, and they really all have their own defined role. Shane Vereen being that, of course, the receiving back out of the backfield, LeGarrette Blunt being the short yardage back, and, you know, I guess at this point, Jonas Gray maybe being just like your every, you know, down kind of a plotting type of player. I don't think there's a whole lot to love about this New England backfield. But what I will say is that I guess if I had to choose somebody, it's probably LeGarrette Blunt going forward just because I think he's most likely to get the goal line carries for this team. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. LeGarrette Blunt's owned in about 40% of ESPN leagues right now. Probably should be owned in most leagues at this point until we kind of get a better idea of what's going to happen. But I wouldn't be out there starting him as my RB1 or my RB2 every week at this point until we kind of get a better idea of what's going to happen. Last guy on the waiver wire list, I have Anthony Dixon of the Buffalo Bills. And it's kind of funny that I have him listed given the fact that Fred Jackson appears to be back and at least fairly healthy. But what I will say is that it's interesting that Anthony Dixon actually got more carries than Fred Jackson in this past game in week 12. He also blocked a punt in that game. So he was contributing not only as a runner, but also as a special teamer. Now, you don't get any points for a blocked punt in most leagues. But what I will say is that it's interesting that he was so productive all over the field. And I kind of think that the coaching staff is going to give him a little bit of a boost on offense to kind of reward him for busting ass on special teams and, you know, getting in there and blocking that punt, which ended up resulting in a touchdown for the Bills. So, I, I do think that he's going to remain in mostly a complimentary role to Fred Jackson, so I, I wouldn't value him over Jackson at this point. But what I will say is that I wouldn't be surprised if Anthony Dixon became this team's short yardage running back going forward. He's built for it. He's the kind of guy that can produce, you know, three yards out of a cloud of dust and, you know, potentially get into the end zone at the goal line. So there could be some deep league fantasy flex value out of an Anthony Dixon going forward. So that's going to wrap things up as far as the way waiver wire section goes, but I want to talk about another guy who came back this past week, and everybody's been excited about it. It was Josh Gordon week in week 12, and he came back with a vengeance, a huge game, eight catches for 120 yards. He was targeted 16 times in this game. Now, I will tell you guys, I questioned if he'd be in football shape coming back, but he kind of proved me wrong. I, I do think that he looked pretty good. I will say, though, that he seemed to be a little bit out of sync with Brian Hoyer on a few passes. A couple of them got intercepted. It was basically, you know, I remember at the goal line, one of them, it looked like he wasn't even looking for the ball. And Hoyer just chucked it up for him, and he just didn't even look for it. It got intercepted in the end zone, which is never a good sign because your your quarterback starts to look at you as a guy who maybe is giving up on routes and things like that. But that didn't really seem to happen. It seemed like Hoyer just continued to throw it to him and continued to throw it to him, even down the stretch of the game uh, when they came back and kicked that final field goal to win the game this past week. It was all really predicated on Josh Gordon being on the field. He made a clutch catch on that drive, and the offense really kind of went as Josh Gordon went throughout the day. So I, I do view this guy as being now a high-end wide receiver two, low-end wide receiver one going forward. If he continues to get targeted 16 times, I mean, he's a, he's a solid wide receiver one if that continues to happen, just because you can't 
even, I mean, even if they complete, you know, half of those passes like they did this past week, eight for 120, that's huge numbers. In PPR leagues, that's a 20-point day. You cannot turn that away. That is a huge game out of a wide receiver. So we definitely here are going to be looking at Josh Gordon as somebody to have in your lineup every week going forward, uh, pretty much regardless of who you have at your other wide receiver positions. It's going to be very difficult to bench Josh Gordon going forward. I know this past week, I had so many people in the comments section of my YouTube video asking me questions on Twitter, um, you know, calling me, sending me texts, and asking me, should I bench Josh Gordon for Des Bryant? Well, yeah, okay, we're going to bench Josh Gordon for Des Bryant or a Jordy Nelson or, you know, big-time wide receivers like that, but for the most part, he should be in there over anybody who's questionable. You know, anybody who's somebody that isn't producing big numbers every single week, yeah, Josh Gordon should probably be in in there above them. So uh, although the Browns offense might not be good enough to get him into the end zone every single week, if he continues to get targeted like he did this past week, which by the way, I don't think will happen. I don't think he's going to get 16 targets a game, but 10 to 12 does not seem out of the, uh, the realm of possibility. So I definitely like Josh Gordon going forward. I would certainly be out there and uh, definitely if he's somehow still on your waiver wire, and I know he was in a couple of leagues, which just blew my mind, there is absolutely absolutely no reason that he should not be rostered in every single league and he should be starting in almost every single league even your eight team leagues get him in your lineup as quickly as possible he's that good couple other stories here quarterback situations that became a little bit different this this week Robert Griffin the third was benched by head coach Jay Gruden in Washington Kind of sounds like this is going to be the end of the RG3 era in Washington didn't last long a lot of injuries, a lot of mediocre play. He was amazing in his rookie year, and we just have not seen anything like that since. Um, the guy just, he doesn't look like he has it anymore. The Redskins have not won a game that RG3 started yet this season. So they are going to turn to Colt McCoy, who will be the starter going forward as far as we can tell. Now, of course, it has kind of been a revolving door in Washington at the quarterback position, so it wouldn't be all that surprising to see them go back to RG3 at some point, but to be completely honest with you guys, I do not see that happening. I do think that RG3 is going to walk this offseason, um, and it's going to be very interesting to see where he goes, what team ends up taking a chance on him. Kind of interesting. My Dallas Cowboys, the head or the owner, excuse me, Jerry Jones, talked about uh, that RG3 has got it, he said, and I'm saying it with quotations, air fingers here. I don't really know what that means. I'm not expecting him to be competing with Tony Romo for the starting job in Dallas next year or anything, but it wouldn't be all that surprising to see the Cowboys go out there and acquire RG3 as potentially being a guy who could develop under a Tony Romo over the next couple of seasons here. The guy still has physical talent. I mean, he has a big arm. He's still very athletic. It's just all about reading defenses at this point. He just doesn't seem to be built for the offense that they have there, which is a very quick read offense. He, when he steps back and he takes his three to five step drop, he needs to be ready to fire the ball right away. And he is not ready to fire the ball right away. When he gets back into that three to five step drop, he's standing there for a second, two, three, four seconds getting hit and he's throwing the ball and it's being, it's being a very incomplete or a very inaccurate throw. There's a lot of incompletions. Um, and obviously he's taking a lot of hits, which is just not good for his long-term health there in Washington. So I don't think this offense is particularly built for RG3. I do think that a Dallas offense, which has a much better offensive line and uh, is more built on running the football first and foremost at this point, I do think that that could potentially serve RG3 well going forward. So it would be very interesting for me to see if the Cowboys actually do go out there and acquire RG3 this offseason if the Redskins do cut him. I do not expect them to go out there and make a trade for him or anything like that, and I don't think they would sign him to a big contract. But at the same time, you kind of have to think that a team like the Cowboys would be a very smart place for RG3 to go where he could learn behind a quarterback who is probably only going to play maybe a couple more seasons before he does end up retiring. So interesting scenario there. It'll be interesting also to see what this does to the wide receiver situation. 
I don't really see there being a drastic difference for anybody, but what I will say is that in the only game that Colt McCoy was really the starter in, I guess you could say, from beginning to end, Deshaun Jackson had six catches for 136 yards, and that was pretty impressive. Um, that was the only one that Colt McCoy really got to play fully in, so I uh, you know, it, he may have that eye for Deshaun Jackson. It could have just been a one-game situational thing against the Cowboys, but, you know, it's definitely worth paying attention to. I think Deshaun Jackson is pretty firmly ahead of Pierre Garçon as far as the wide receiver position in Washington goes at this point, but, you know, neither player is particularly amazing for fantasy right now. I, I consider both of them as kind of a low-end wide receiver two, high-end wide receiver three at the moment. Next thing, another benched quarterback. Mike Vick sits down now for the New York Jets. So we've got, obviously, Rex Ryan at head coach, and he decides to make this move here. I don't really understand it. They benched Geno Smith earlier this year due to poor play, and I kind of talked about this on a previous podcast at that time, and I said... You know, when you do this, you kind of are making the decision that this guy is not your quarterback going forward. You can't sit a guy, you know, three, four weeks into the season because he's, you know, he hasn't done what you expect him to do up until this point. And I understand Geno Smith has been awful. He has not been good. He has had really poor performances, but you have to keep him in your lineup. You have to fight through it, and you have to see what you have in this guy. You cannot go to a Mike Vick, who at this point we understand is not an accurate quarterback. He doesn't have the athletic ability that he once did, and there really isn't much of an upside to him at this point. So, you know, I it's interesting that they're going back to Geno Smith is all I'm saying. And I think it really just shows how incompetent at this point Rex Ryan is as the head coach there in, in New York. I don't foresee him being the coach going forward in 2015. Um, if he makes it out of this season, they're one of the worst teams in the league this year. Absolutely dreadful performances on a week-to-week basis. They have not looked good most of the time. And for a head coach that has been in the media as much as Rex Ryan, yeah, that's just not a good thing. (laughs) So uh, to be honest with you guys, I don't think this changes their offense all that much either. What I will tell you is that I do think their running game may get a little bit better, or at least the running backs might start to produce better numbers, possibly in the receiving game. Uh, I saw a stat from uh, Mike Clay who is a fantasy football analyst as well. And I think he mentioned that Geno Smith does target running backs in the passing game a little bit more than Mike Vick does. So it's worth noting, at least. I don't think that either Chris Johnson or Chris Ivory is suddenly going to become a PPR monster or anything. But, you know, that you might see them catch a pass or two more per game. And that could translate into a few extra points for your fantasy team going forward. But uh, bottom line, the Jets offense is pretty bad. And you really just don't want much of a part of any of this at at this point in the season, there really isn't much to be excited about. Eric Decker and Percy Harvin, I think, are really the only guys that I would be considering starting. Maybe if you're in a desperate situation, you can go with a Chris Ivory and a Chris Johnson, but it's just been so bad. So I'm really not excited about the Jets. I'm really not excited about the Redskins, but what I am excited about is answering some questions for from you guys here uh, from YouTube. And it's, you know, it's been kind of a, a long time coming that I get through just a couple of questions here and then we're able to actually do a full you know, set up for some of these games that are coming up today. And I want to do that. So what I want to do is just answer a couple of questions here. And the first one is in regards to Denard Robinson or Frank Gore, or excuse me, the two of those guys. Um, Neither player has been very productive. And what this person wants to know is, should I be looking elsewhere at running back? Now, he did also mention that he has C.J. Anderson and Jeremy Hill, and LeGarrette Blunt is available. So, Denard Robinson, Frank Gore, Jeremy Hill, C.J. Anderson, and LeGarrette Blunt. Now, I'm going to assume that you can start two of these guys and one at the flex. So, what I am going to say is that number one, C.J. Anderson at this point, given the fact that the other running backs in Denver are not healthy, he absolutely has to be in your lineup. This guy has produced monster numbers in these past couple of games since since um, Ronnie Hillman and Monty Ball have been out. He's been an RB1. So, yes, get him in your lineup immediately. I don't know why he wasn't in your lineup this past week, but he absolutely needs to be in your lineup this week without question. Put him in as your RB1. 
Now your RB2 this week, um, it, it's tough. Because I think Frank Gore has the toughest matchup of everybody. Uh, he is going up against the Seattle Seahawks, which is, of course, never a good matchup. Frank Gore does have a history of putting up decent numbers against these guys. But it's really not still anything to be very excited about. He has had some poor, poor performances against them recently as well. Now, Denard Robinson's up against the Giants, who have struggled defensively. So I do think that I'm going to put Denard Robinson in here as one of my starters this week. Uh, I know, obviously he was disappointing this past week but he's still getting the touches and really that's all that we can go off of is touches other than that you're really just banking on touchdowns and and breaking a couple of runs if a guy touches the ball 15 times hopefully he's going to break for a touchdown or you know hopefully he's got you know at least a four yard per carry average to give you six points in the running game and maybe he can catch some passes as well that's kind of what I see out of Denard Robinson I don't see a huge high-end potential I'd probably play him as my flex this week now, it comes down to Frank Gore, Jeremy Hill, or LeGarrette Blunt. Ugh, very tough to know. What what do you want to do here? Um, LeGarrette Blunt obviously coming off of a huge game, and like I mentioned before, I'm not for certain that I see him as being the RB1 there going forward. They are up against the Green Bay Packers this week in Green Bay. Ugh, probably the biggest primetime game that we've seen as far as offenses go anyway. So, you know, I, I could see playing LeGarrette Blunt just because, it, like I mentioned, there's a good possibility that he gets in at the end zone. But I am actually kind of leaning toward Jeremy Hill. Jeremy Hill has been an absolute monster. And even when Gio Bernard has been back, he's still getting a substantial number of touches. So I kind of like him in this matchup here against the Buccaneers. The Bucs have been awful on defense all season. So I'm probably going with Jeremy Hill as my RB2, CJ Anderson as my RB1, and then Denard Robinson as my flex with, you know, like I mentioned, the possibility of a Garrett Blunt sneaking in there over Denard Robinson. But hopefully that helps you out. I would not be playing Frank Gore this week. I just do not like the matchup, and I just don't think he's been producing enough fantasy stats that we should disregard the fact that he's been, uh, that, you know, he's going up in this tough matchup. So... All right, next question comes from Sean V228 on YouTube, and he needs two of these players in a standard scoring league, so no PPR. He's got Alshon Jeffrey at Detroit, Kelvin Benjamin at Minnesota, and Golden Tate versus Chicago. So, a couple of games here for Thursday and uh, the Thanksgiving Day games with Alshon Jeffrey and Golden Tate playing against one another. I'm going to go with Kelvin Benjamin as an obvious one at this point. He's going up against the Vikings, who have been eh, not great against the pass uh, this season. Um, he is averaging a uh, pretty much almost a touchdown a game at this point. He's putting up huge, huge numbers this year, and he's coming off a bye week. That team should be getting healthier, so I do think that there's a good possibility that Kelvin Benjamin gets into the end zone this week. The Vikings have also given up 525 yards and four touchdowns to opposing wide receivers over their past three games, so this is a good matchup. Kelvin Benjamin is my wide receiver one in this grouping, and my wide receiver two, uh, this one's a little bit tougher. Um, I think that it's pretty close between these two guys. But I am and going to end up going with Golden Tate. And I understand Golden Tate's cooled off significantly over the past couple of weeks. But the Lions have also been up against two pretty tough secondaries, which are Arizona and New England. I think that they have a much easier matchup this week against the Bears, who are 21st in the league in fantasy points per game allowed to opposing wide receivers. They also just gave up 277 yards worth of receiving yardage to the Bucks wide receivers this past week. So I think there's a good possibility that Golden Tate sneaks into the end zone and has a solid day, seven, eight receptions, and that should be good enough to be a wide receiver too for you. I do like Elshon Jeffrey, but I will say that the Lions have still allowed the third fewest fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. And uh, to be honest with you, other than the game that they had this past week against the Patriots, they have been really an elite fantasy defense all season. They have not allowed many teams to score many points. Chicago is kind of about as cold as it gets right now on offense. So I just, I don't love what you have as far as an upside for Alshon Jeffrey, even despite the fact that he has touchdowns in back-to-back -to -back games. So 
Hopefully that helps you out. I want to talk a little bit more about this Bears-Lions game, though, because I do think that it's it's worth talking about each of these Thanksgiving Day games because they're all on the short week, which can produce solid fantasy numbers. We've seen it many, many times where, you know, teams just defensively, they're not prepared for what the offense is going to bring to bring at them on a Thursday night game. So let's get in here and talk a little bit about the Bears-Lions. We're going to start off with the Lions. Matt Stafford has been atrocious lately, hasn't thrown a touchdown in either of his past two games, despite having Calvin Johnson on the field. We really thought that Megatron would bring, you know, a, a new sense of glory to that offense, I guess, if, if, for lack of a better phrase. I think that they just, they were, ex we maybe were just expecting too much out of these guys. And perhaps they were expecting too much of themselves because there seems to be a lot of frustration right now in, in Detroit as well. Stafford's completing just 43% of the targets that he throws at Calvin Johnson since he came back from an injury. That's not good. That's, that's really, really bad. And we talked about this a few minutes ago, but Despite the fact that Golden Tate has been pretty good throughout most of the season, he has kind of struggled in his past couple of games. Only six total catches in his past two contests. So, you know, this is not the Detroit offense that we've seen over the past few seasons, which has been one of the best passing games in the league. Chicago's pass defense, however, has been pretty bad this year. They've given up an average of almost 300 yards passing over their past four games, including 13 passing touchdowns, which to me means that despite the fact that Calvin has been pretty weak over the past couple of weeks, I think that he is a must start. I think that he's a solid wide receiver one this week. I do expect him to get back onto the, the good graces of fantasy owners this week. I also think Golden Tate, like I mentioned, is... He's a low-end wide receiver too, in my opinion, but I still think that he's worth starting. I would have him in my lineup this week. Now, it's worth noting, the Bears have not given up a rushing touchdown since week seven, which means that Joik Bell is probably no better than an RB2 in this, in this one, but it is nice that he has taken 23 carries over his past two games, so it's worth considering that he is getting a decent amount of touches. So if you do have to get him in there as a flex or as a low-end RB2, I understand. But to me, I would probably not be too excited about Joyke Bell this week, even given the fact that Reggie Bush is not going to play. On the other side of the football, Jay Cutler has been equally as terrible as Matt Stafford, only threw for 130 yards this past week against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense that has been one of the worst in the league this season. So, um, you know, he's coming off of the worst game of his season. Uh, one of the worst games I can ever recall Jay Cutler having as far as yardage goes, 130 yards. That is just ridiculously terrible. Now, the Lions defense, like I had mentioned before, third best in the league in fantasy points per game allowed to opposing quarterbacks. So this is an excellent fantasy defense. I would be looking to bench Jay Cutler this week. Elshon Jeffrey, Brandon Marshall, both probably wide receiver twos this week. I like Marshall better than I like Jeffrey, but the thing is, is they will probably be in most fantasy lineups just because they were drafted so high and with such confidence going into the season that not a lot of people have a ton of guys to put in in front of them. What I will say is that if you've got a Josh Gordon that you acquired off of the waiver wire, I would certainly be playing him over either of these guys. And, uh, you know, there's there's a handful of other guys, like I would mentioned, I would probably play Golden Tate over an Alshon Jeffrey, although I would probably go Marshall slightly over a Golden Tate at this point as well. So, you know, it's this is really not a great game for fantasy success, to be completely honest with you. I think um, you're looking at Calvin Johnson as being, like I mentioned, an obvious starter. Everybody else. Uh, on the Detroit side of the football, I'm not super excited about. And on Chicago side of the ball, I mean, Brandon Marshall, like I mentioned, is probably going to be in your lineup. Alshon is probably going to be in your lineup, especially if you start three wide receivers. Matt Forte is somebody that you just start every single week. This is a, a brutally tough matchup. The Lions have allowed the second fewest rushing yards in the league this season, and they've kind of done a great job of shutting down most opposing running backs throughout the year. But they have been beaten up a little bit by running backs who can catch the ball. So that's something that Forte is very, very good at. He's one of the absolute best in the league. I think he remains a must start at running back this week and really in any matchup. He's just such a big part of the Chicago offense that he touches the ball too much to ever be on your bench in fantasy. You have to start him every single week. 
Next game, late in the later in the afternoon, we are going to see the the Dallas Cowboys at home against the Philadelphia Eagles. This will be for sole possession of the NFC East. And uh, that's a huge thing right now as we go down the stretch. These teams both sitting at 8-3, and three, great records, but both of them have had kind of a history of falling apart near the end of season. So it will be very interesting to see what happens in this one. Mark Sanchez is going to be the guy who you want to keep your eyes on here for the Philadelphia Eagles. He's thrown for 300-plus yards in three straight games. I think I saw a stat the other day that Mark Sanchez hadn't thrown for back-to-back 300-yard games in any game in his entire career. Now he has three straight for the Eagles. Pretty interesting stuff. So, uh, you know, obviously this Philadelphia offense is it's fairly forgiving to quarterbacks, and, and it helps them produce solid numbers. So, you know, definitely something to keep in mind here that, it, you know, regardless of who the quarterback is in Philadelphia, it seems like they're producing solid numbers. Now, Mark Sanchez does have a tendency to throw in interceptions. He has thrown a few over the past couple of weeks, but I still think that he is a low-end QB1 or a high-end QB2 for your two quarterback leagues this week. I would actually play him over the aforementioned Jay Cutler, and I would also possibly play him over Matt Stafford. So that should tell you something. I think that there's going to be a good number of points scored in this game. Dallas has struggled against the pass in recent weeks, including a three-touchdown, 338-yard performance to Eli Manning this past week. Now, a lot of that, of course, had to do with the fact that Odell Beckham was making such ridiculous catches. But even still, it's not it's not something to completely disregard that the Cowboys defense has not looked lately like it did at the beginning of the year when they were looking very, very good. Jeremy Macklin, he's kind of slowed down with Mark Sanchez at quarterback. He's only scored once in his past three games, but I still think he is a must start. He's still getting targeted more than Jordan Matthews, who has also actually been heating up. He has 18 catches for 322 yards and three touchdowns over his past three games. And I think he is at this point becoming a pretty solid wide receiver too. Probably a must start for most people going into this game. LaShawn McCoy is another guy who you definitely need to have in your lineup this week. He finally showed up for the for the uh, Eagles this past week in Week 12. 21 carries for 131 yards and a touchdown. It's been a long time since we've seen that type of production from him. He still has been pretty much non-existent almost in the passing game, which is just so baffling considering he was one of the best wider, you know, catching running backs in in his first few seasons in the league, really. He was one of the absolute best. I think he had uh, multiple 70 catch seasons, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, this is definitely a guy who can make plays in the receiving game. They're just not using him that way, and I, I don't really understand why. I guess maybe because Darren Sproles has been such a, a prominent part of the offense, and he's maybe even better at it than McCoy, but it's just crazy to me that he is being used so sparingly as a receiver. Now, it is interesting to note that LaShawn McCoy is getting a very substantial amount of total touches despite the fact that he's not getting a lot of receptions. He's taken 20 or more carries in six of his past seven games, which to me makes him a must start. Anytime that a guy's getting 20 touches in a game, he is going to be in my lineup almost in any contest. It doesn't almost matter what type of defense he's up against, and especially against the Cowboys defense that, like I had mentioned, has not been great as of late. Tony Romo. That's a guy who has been amazing as of late. Absolutely red hot. Seven passing touchdowns over his past two games. This is one of the best stretches of his entire career. Des Bryant has also been red hot. Four touchdowns over his past two games. Six touchdowns over his past four games. He is on pace to have one of the best seasons that he has had as a fantasy receiver, despite the fact that Tony Romo has been struggling as far as injuries go. So definitely an awesome lineup here for the Cowboys. Their past game has been awesome and this looks like a good matchup because the Eagles have allowed the second most fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers nine touchdowns in their past five games to opposing wide receivers Des Bryant a high-end wide receiver one could have the potential to score multiple game or multiple touchdowns in this game just like he has the past two games so I certainly think you need to have Des in your lineup uh, I wouldn't play hardly anybody above him at this point Demarius Thomas maybe you know but I, I think Des you could make a case is this the number two wide receiver this week behind Demarius 
Terrence Williams is a guy who I think could be a boomer bust type of a player. He has been that kind of throughout his career, really, so far, uh, and especially this season. He's been definitely a touchdown or nothing type of player. But if you're desperate, like I had mentioned, Philadelphia's defense is allowing a ton of receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers. So it's certainly worth considering putting him in if you're in a tough situation this week. Um, I don't love him going forward anymore. Uh, earlier in the year, it looked like he was going to be a more substantial part of the offense, but it's kind of trailed off since then. So, you know, get him in your lineup this week if you need to, but, you know, don't expect great things down the stretch. If he comes out and he has, you know, three catches for 100 yards and a touchdown this week, don't think that that's going to just continue to happen down the stretch. Make sure that you reanalyze the situation given the defense that they're going to be up against. Now, one thing to note is that the Eagles have actually been pretty decent against the tight end position this year, but they have been actually torched lately by a couple of tight ends. Delaney Walker and Greg Olson both had nice games against them. Jason Witten has actually scored in back-to-back -back games and could definitely have the opportunity to make it three straight in this one. I certainly think that given the fact that the tight end position is so weak this year, he is a must-start at tight end. DeMarco Murray, without question, you're putting him in as your starting running back. I mean, the guy is the best running back in fantasy football so far this year. He's had 100 yards in all but one game. Despite the fact that he hasn't scored a touchdown since week seven, I am certainly considering him as one of the best running backs this week against a mediocre Philadelphia defense. So hopefully that helps you guys out with those two games. Final one that we're going to talk about today before we wrap up the show, Seattle at San Francisco. This is the game that everybody has been excited for for quite some time, ever since these teams played in the NFC Championship this past year. Two of the best defenses in the league this year, and definitely two of the best defenses against opposing quarterbacks. The 49ers, the number one defense in fantasy points per game, allowed to opposing quarterbacks. Seattle right behind them at number two, which makes both of these quarterbacks tough to start, to be honest with you makes them very tough to trust, certainly, especially Colin Kaepernick. He has been mediocre as all hell recently. He hasn't thrown for more than one touchdown since week six, and he isn't really contributing hardly at all in the running game. I certainly would not trust him as a QB1 this week. I almost wouldn't trust him as a QB2 this week. So if you're in two quarterback leagues, I think he is at the low end of the QB2 spectrum. I have him ranked about 20th this week against Seattle. Definitely not a, a matchup that I'm super excited about. Now, Russell Wilson, their passing game has been mediocre as well in Seattle. He has thrown for just three touchdowns over his past four four games combined. And that also includes the fact that he has been under 215 yards passing in all but two games this season. Very, very low passing numbers, but he is making up for it with his running. He has actually rushed for at least 70 yards in three straight games, and he's been over 100 yards rushing in three games this season amazing running numbers. These are the kind of running numbers that we haven't seen since Mike Vick's time in Atlanta. I mean, it's been that long. I mean, he's he is honestly on pace right now to rush for the second most yardage of any quarterback in the history of the league. And if he has a big game this week against the 49ers, there's no reason to think that he couldn't potentially threaten Mike Vick's record, which is over a thousand yards rushing, by the way, in a season. And that's just insane for a quarterback. I mean, if you if you put those numbers down, that's 100 fantasy points in your standard scoring leagues just on running the ball. That's crazy. You have, you have to just think about that for a second. That's 100 points. If you take that and just put it into touchdowns, that's 25 passing touchdowns. That's the equivalent. That's insane. So given the fact that he is putting up that type of rushing numbers, uh, along with the fact that he's probably still going to throw for 20 to 25 touchdowns this year, Russell Wilson is probably a guy who you can't bench this week. Although I understand this is a very, very difficult fantasy defense uh, in terms of points allowed to opposing quarterbacks. Like I said, they're the best in the league, San Francisco, at this point in the season. So, you know... It's, it's a tough one. It really is. I think this is the toughest game that Russell Wilson will have this season on the road at San Francisco. They will play in a couple of weeks back in Seattle, and that might be a little bit more forgiving to him. But, man, this is a tough one. If there's a week to bench Russell Wilson, it's probably this week. But given the fact that he's been a top-five fantasy quarterback with his rushing numbers, um, it's going to be really tough to bench him. 
Uh, there just aren't a whole lot of guys out there right now that I can consider starting above him unless you've got, you know, a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers or a Drew Brees or a Peyton Manning or one of those type of guys, Andrew Luck. I can't really bench him for anybody else at this point. It's just, it's too difficult. You know, you may be able to make a case for like a Tony Romo, like I had mentioned, given the fact that he's been so hot and the Eagles defense is so terrible, but even that's going to be really difficult. Russell Wilson's just been so good lately, so I would not blame anybody for having them in his, their lineup this week. Now, as far as his receivers go, and and really the receivers on both sides of the football, I'm really only looking at Anquan Bolden as being a guy who I would even start uh, and that includes tight ends as well. Vernon Davis is pretty much non-existent in fantasy at this point. If he's still on your roster, drop him. Pick up somebody who is actually going to give you points. This guy is not doing it. He hasn't been doing it all season. Since week one, he hasn't had a game that's even worth talking about. So why would you keep him on your roster? Get rid of him. Go pick up a guy like a Delaney Walker or a... Um, Gosh, I mean, there's just so many guys out there that I would rather have. I mean, you could just name off a, a ton of guys who are just positional players, you know, guys who are just almost completely random. I mean, Jared Cook, I'd rather have at this point than Vernon Davis. Um, I, there's just so many guys. I'd rather have backup tight ends. I'd rather have Tim Wright at this point than a Vernon Davis. So just don't bother with him anymore. Get rid of him off of your roster. It's not worth it. Michael Crabtree for the 49ers, I think you could consider playing, but I only like him as a wide receiver three this week. He's probably going to see a lot of Richard Sherman, and as we've seen in the past, he has done a very good job of stopping Michael Crabtree, Sherman has, so I'm not super excited about Crabtree's upside this week. And Look, Anquan Bolden has really been the guy in this offense that has given Colin Kaepernick some sort of consistency. He has at least four catches in nine straight games. He has three touchdowns in his past four games, and he's coming off his biggest game of the year this past week against the Redskins. I still only like him as a wide receiver, too, against this secondary, but, I mean, he's the only guy that I'm excited about. On Seattle's side of the ball, um, you may be able to consider a guy like a Doug Baldwin, but I, I mean, he's like a real low end wide receiver three low end flex option. And he's really just trickling on that edge of just not even being that, especially in this matchup. So don't be too excited to have anybody in the Seattle passing game in your offense or in your uh, fantasy team other than Russell Wilson at this point. Running the ball, Frank Gore. On again, off again this whole season, but the realistic potential for him having a big game just isn't good here. Um, two of his three games last year, he was just awful against Seattle, and the other one, he had over 100 yards, so I mean, it's it's tough. You know, you look at Frank Gore as somebody who, you know, if he gets going, he has a really good game, but there's, there's been so many times this year where he has done absolutely nothing. This isn't a good matchup. I think he is, to me not a guy who I would have in my RB2 slot even. I think he's a flex option, or if you're in a league where you start three running backs, I would play him there. Other than that, I'm not excited about him. Now, Marshawn Lynch, on the other hand, remains an RB1 even in this tough matchup against the 49ers. 49ers have the fifth-ranked fantasy points per game defense against opposing running backs, but look, Alfred Morris ran well against them this past week, and he has a fairly similar style to Marshawn Lynch, so despite the fact that Marshawn Lynch had a kind of a down game this past week, he is definitely going to be in my lineup this week against the 49ers, especially given the fact that he has had actually pretty solid success against them over the past, you know, six, seven times that they've played. So hopefully that helps you guys out. I want to wish everybody good luck this week. I know it's been uh, it's been a pretty quick week as far as going from Sunday football, and we had a bunch of games to Thursday football, and we've got three big, big games, a lot of fantasy implications in these ones. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button. Give it a thumbs up. It really helps the channel grow. And if you're new to the channel, please also be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can be updated when I put out the next episode. If you have any questions about your lineup for this week's games, I would be glad to answer those. I will do as, as best as I can to answer them before the games start today if they are, you know, if your question includes today's games. But other than that you know uh, I will of course double check them on Saturday and Sunday to get back to you guys and answer those questions we will do another show on Saturday so be on the lookout for that and we'll try to answer those as quickly as we can prior to Sunday's games thank you guys again so much for listening check back later this week where I will have a 
full preview of this Sunday's games and, of course, the Monday game as well. And I will, of course, answer all of your questions from YouTube and Twitter and give you my busts and sleepers for this weekend's games here in Week 13. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I hope to see you guys next time here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. (laughs) 